find ourselves now to the final chapter again of our Lord's Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, which is um, debated whether Matthew 7 is a part of the Sermon of the Mount or is it just a bunch of random stories and teachings of Christ and just put into one. We have already discussed that we believe hi highly that it is truly a part of the Sermon on the Mount because the Lord has a recurring theme all over the entire chapter, aside from verses 7 to 11, the entire chapter has a recurring theme of the subject of judgment. In verse 1 through 6, and I do not want to go over an uh, entire overview as I believe there's a lot of things that we can go over today, uh, but just briefly, verse 1 through 6 gives us cons uh, a judgment concerning others, how we judge others. In verse 12, it concerns how we treat others concerning our judgment toward them, when it tells us that whatever we wish to do unto others, we do unto them, or whatever we would like done unto ourselves, we do unto them. In verses 13 through 14, it speaks of our judgment in life's direction, whether we enter the broad way or the narrow way into life. Verses 15 through 20 concerns our judgment of men's fruits, of false prophets and teachers, that we will know of them. And so this speaks of our understanding of truth and falsehood. In verse 21 to 27, it concerns God's ultimate judgment for all who claim to know him. And Luke 6, our, parable pa or sorry, our parallel passage, also reflects the same theme of judgment, just a shorter account as we had just read. Matthew, of course, gives us an entire chapter speaking of bewaring false teachers, the golden rule, and everything else, whereas Luke's is a little shorter in account, but still the very same theme as it's talking about the same sermon that the Lord um, was speaking to his disciples on that day. Yet we are reminded, despite that these sections have their own theme, that there is an overarching theme, an overarching truth over the entire Sermon on the Mount, and that is the Heavenly Father has eyes over all of His children, that our relationship in this earth has to revolve and submit itself to our relationship with the Heavenly Father. He sees our lives on this earth in all things. And that's exactly where chapter 5 takes us. It's not just a change of heart, but it teaches us how we actually have to, uh, to live in an earth where we are confronted by a sinful system, a sinful world, a flesh, and the devil. And so he has his eyes upon us, and we've learned his eyes upon us not only in our thoughts of the world, in thoughts of his word, but in our handling of our possessions, in our relationship with troubles and anxiety and all sorts of things. But now this section teaches us that he has his eyes even in our relationship toward each other. God is concerned about how we treat each other. God is concerned about how we view our neighbors, and most importantly, how we view ourselves. How we view God will reflect how we view ourselves and then how we, review or how we view our neighbors. And as we have relationships as believers, the Lord recognizes a great threat to our relationships, a threat which destroys our corporate unity, a threat which destroys our neighbor that we may perhaps pronounce an anathema toward. And most of all, ultimately, when we don't realize it the most, in our great pronouncement of a heavy curse over our neighbor, we are ultimately judging ourselves. It is a great threat to our own lives before God. Because we have a tendency within ourselves to take the position of God. This is why the Lord opens up this chapter, Judge Not. We know that all over Scripture, that there is one ultimate judge. It is our Heavenly Father, God Himself. But in our weakness, we have a tendency to bend and become or position ourselves as though we were God. But the difference with us and God is that our positioning is consumed by a, hyper, a hypercritical attitude, a censorious spirit. It places condemnation on people when we are incapable of passing such a powerful curse. And we place our neighbors below us with a feeling of superiority. It is an attitude that formulates its judgments based upon self-righteousness and arrogance. It doesn't desire to help anybody. It desires to elevate self and to diminish their neighbor. 
And so it always has a feeling of self involved in its judgments. It is always run by the feeling of, I must be right and everyone else is wrong. It is with that mentality. And it is always, as we learned last Lord's Day, that this spirit always is ready to despise their neighbor. It is always ready to talk derogatory about their peers, but is never, to, uh, never ready to show mercy uh, toward them. It is merciless. It is always seeking the failures of one. If it can't find it in one neighbor, it will try to find it in another person. And when it finds a failure, it rejoices in it. It's glad that they saw, the, uh, they're glad that they saw their neighbor's failure and they feel triumphant because they are, again, quote unquote, superior over them. And again, they're never satisfied until they can find someone else failing um, as long as they are not at the, below their peers. It is a spirit that degrades, again, a dangerous one because it is merciless and it will ruin our relationships. For this reason, the Lord gives us a strong two-word command, an injunction that says, judge not. And I had mentioned to you last Lord's Day that this misinterpretation of those two words has led to the decline and destruction of our entire society. It is the very reason why truth is not relevant anymore. Society accepts all-inclusiveness, equality in all measures because of the term, judge not. And it has also impacted our church, local church, universal church, and understanding that. And so men and women are, are not so um, uh, keen to receiving discipline or being under uh, the church authority as given to us by Christ, the head of the church. And so we can fall to one extreme or the other, which is why we must be very, very careful with this text, judge not. Uh, the Lord here is not forbidding, as we are reminded, judgments in all sorts. This is not to mean that he despises any sort of judgment. He despises any sort of criticism. Again, all of scripture teaches us as a whole that there is holy criticism. There is constructive criticism. And these things are for the building of the saints and for the sanctification of the corporate whole. But there is that hypercritical attitude which he despises in this text that he is speaking about. And so, just to clear out our thoughts again, the Lord is not despising all sorts of judgment to say no constructive, uh, constructive criticism, no discernment, uh, and no discipline. Remember in verse 6 of the same chapter, the Lord still reminds us that we are to um, understand and discern who are those individuals who are characterized as uh, dogs and pigs and that we are not to throw the pearls to the swine and to give that which is holy to dogs. That requires judgment. That requires discernment. Also the same in verses 15 and 20 that we are to beware of false prophets and to know them by their fruits. We're going to need judgment there. We're going to need discernment of some sort to be able to identify falsehood from truth. And so the Lord does not eliminate the totality of judgment, but again, what he's hinting here is the severity of that judgment, which we must consider. Again, Matthew 18 teaches us that we are to sanctify the church by correcting our brother who has sinned against us or anyone in the church, and we are to do this by a three-step st process, whether of in, uh, personally or to, uh, with a plurality of individuals to the corporate whole, discipline must be practiced in the church, and none of that can be possible if judgment is eliminated. Then in 1 John 4, the apostle of love says that we are to test the spirits. The same author accounts for what the word, uh, Lord Jesus says in John 7, 24. He, the Lord says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So there you have it. Constructive criticism is permitted if it leads to the building of the saints and the sanctification of the corporate whole. But again, what he does hate is a hypercritical attitude which destroys, and that's what he's speaking of here. Be reminded again that the Lord here is making constant contrast, a constant comparison to the Pharisees. He's reminding us what the Pharisees believed, but this is what he reinstates as the law had already state, uh, said and, and mentioned in the past. And so the Lord is giving us qualities of heaven, and he's putting them in comparison to the Pharisees who are self-righteous, arrogant. But he is raising this concern to his disciples less we think that the Pharisees are the only ones who have that type of heart. Even the church can have a Pharisee in spirit. 
And it's kind of sad that we call it the Pharisee in spirit because it is not just for the Pharisees. It is for all, even in the church, for you and I. And so we must recognize then that the Christian life on this earth requires great balance, great discipline. It requires us to stay firm on the grounds of the middle, not to fall left or right, where we have no judgment at all and where we are so severe in judgment. We must be wise in the will of the Lord that we may fall in, in always in the hands of God's mercy. And so this morning, as always, the Lord gives us a command so strong, but he always backs it up with reasoning to why we should follow the command. For example, he says, judge not. And so he gives us an entire um, uh, supporting understanding of reasons of why we should not judge. The first statement, you'll find this both in Luke 6 and Matthew 7, is in verse 1 of Matthew 7. It says, judge not that you be not judged. In another way we can express, I suppose, could say, do not judge in order that you, you, you yourself may not be judged by others. Do not judge to avoid judgment from other people. It's a very practical reasoning, yet it is still leaving us with a great challenge for interpretation. Many understand this to mean if you do not like to be criticized, don't criticize other people. Which is where the challenge comes in, although it is true that we must be cautious of the way we pronounce our judgments, because that calls for the same criticism thrown in our direction. But there is a stronger meaning, though that is true. We are not to judge severely, lest we too are judged severely by our neighbors. But the Lord is not really concerned about what others think about you. Remember, the overarching principle of all of the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord has mentioned that the Father's eyes are always on us. So in verse 1 of this text, what he's really saying, judge not severely, lest you be judged severely by God who is the ultimate judge. It's one thing, and I suppose you can say it is twofold, judged by your neighbors because of your poor judgment of them, and also ultimately the judge of the judgment of the Father according to your standard. And so what you do unto others will be done unto you. And that's really the lesson you get from this section. When you, look, uh, when you read Luke 6, the entirety of that section from 37 to 42 is really about what you do unto others is what you will have happen to you. Or the ancient phrase that is used among old folk, not much so with us, uh, but the statement, you will be paid back with your own coin. And so whatever you pay and whatever you uh, dispense will be given back to you in return. However true that principle may be, the greater knowledge of this text is that the Father will judge us based upon our severity. And so every so often we'll get the uh, question, uh, Pastor John, John 5.24 says, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. Or a familiar text is John, uh, sorry, Romans 8.1, where it says that uh, we have no condemnation we are no longer under condemnation in Christ. And so the question rises, Pastor, does that mean that we as Christians no longer are under judgment, that we won't be judged, that we won't have any sort of criticism coming from the divine God who sits on his throne? As best as I can, I try to respond in helping them understand the context and the use of the word judgment. Of course, in those two texts mentioned is in reference to eternal damnation. Eternal condemnation. So yes, God will not condemn his children unto eternal wrath, eternal damnation. However, scripture still teaches, teaches us that though we are not judged for final death, that we are still judged as believers on this world. Scripture speaks of a few types of judgment, and I think it's important that we talk about them briefly because we do not want to eliminate the word judgment the moment we read judgment that it's immediately gone Scripture gives us a balance of understanding the judgments. First and foremost, the great and ultimate judgment of Matthew 25 in reference to God's judgment of the entire world, of the entire human race, where he will bring a, a conclusion to the destinies of the goats and the sheep, where he will bring to light those who are with him and those who are not. 
In Matthew 25, it says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people from one another as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So it is a final ju judgment where He separates those of righteousness and those of unrighteousness. Secondly, Scripture speaks of a judgment we are subject to in this life as believers. Believe it or not, God chastises His children. God disciplines His children. And so we should not think that just because we have passed from death unto life and that we're free from eternal condemnation, that we are not uh, no longer bound by God's discipline or the Father's chastising of our sins and our blemishes. Scripture speaks of a judgment even on this earth that happens every hour when we commit sin or disobedience against the Lord. I'd like to show you this in 1 Corinthians 11, please, as we turn there together and just have an idea when Paul is talking about the respect that believers, the Corinthians, should have when it comes to the communion. Because many of them have despised their brethren, become selfish, and yet they have thought of themselves fit to receive the Lord's table when they have committed sin against the holy God. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. The Word of God says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. That's important, the word examine. Let a person judge himself, test himself, weigh himself. Verse 29, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now immediately, pastor, what does it mean? Does it mean that if I take the Lord's table in vain, that I'm going to fall into that no condemnation status is stripped from me, that I'm now going to be placed on the side of the wicked? No. Well, Paul gives us those examples of types of judgment that Corinthians had for taking the Lord's table in vain in verse 30. That is why many of you are weak and ill and, have, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. In other words, if we examined ourselves well, then we would not be under this discipline of our Heavenly Father. And so he says in verse 32, But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. You see? And so, yes, we are not under the eternal judgment of God for wrath, but we are not exempt from His disciplinary actions either when we commit sin and when we are disobedient to our Heavenly Father. And I think we take it for light, uh, take it, sorry, for granted, and we take it very lightly. Dr. Lloyd-Jones says, we should educate ourselves and place it upon our hearts, the fear of the Lord in such an intense manner that when we, that when we sin against Him, we expect almost immediately that His hand of discipline is about to strike itself upon us. I think it is a great uh, deceiving thought and notion to think that we can sin against God without discipline. He will discipline His children for the sake of your sanctification, lest you become like the world, eternally condemned like them. And so, be aware of this, uh, not to place fear in your hearts that you might get sick or ill or die, uh, but really those are the types of judgments God has, and so severely over the Corinthians because of how they handled themselves be before their neighbors. And really that was the judgment of God. It was upon the sin that these men and women despised their neighbors, and then they took communion afterward. And so it is a judgment in this life that I'm speaking of that God punishes His children because of their disobedience. And so that calls us then to walk circumspectly, to carefully examine ourselves, our hearts, and our way every hour to see whether we are walking in righteousness. This is why the author of Hebrews grants or provides a warning to the Hebrews who perhaps were discouraged of what was happening with them, and they were encouraged of what the Lord has done for them to atone for their sins. 
And Hebrews 12, verse 5 and 6 says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? The subject matter is always um, questioned whether the Lord is talking to unbelievers regarding judgment and discipline. The author of Hebrews, I think, I think is very clear when he says that this is an exhortation that addresses sons, children of God. He says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And so this is that second judgment that Scripture speaks of that daily we may be subject to depending upon our obedience to God. One way or the other, he will discipline us that we may not be those who are considered um, without fathers, as old uh, English would say, bastards, without someone tending to them, without someone caring for them. And I think it should alarm us even further if our lives aren't under discipline, if we are on smooth grounds and smooth sailings. Remember the psalmist that questions the Lord and says, why does the wicked prosper so great? Why does the wicked get so rich? And it's almost like they don't have any problems. But why we who are righteous are struggling, the psalmist says. Well, it's a good thing when you consider that he's disciplining you, you know that you are sons and daughters. At the same time, you shouldn't love sinning against God because that judgment will keep on recurring until you snap out of that type of pattern of a lifestyle. And so as he prepares us for glory, this judgment disciplines us and it rids us of our sins and our blemishes. But thirdly, the judgment, another judgment that scripture speaks of is simultaneous on the day of the judge of a uh, judgment day of the Lord, the uh, what we call the Bema seat of Christ, the day of the Lord when he returns. Yes, he will separate the goat from the sheep, but at the same time, there is a judgment concerning rewards. Scholars call this the judgment of rewards. Remember Paul's writing to the ministers, to the Corinthians, in chapter 3. He says, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone is burnt up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So it is speaking of ministers who built upon the foundation of the apostles. And if their work is done in faithfulness and obedience, then it will grow and the Lord will reward them for it. But if they do it in unfaithfulness, they will be saved. However, they will lose out on a reward. But pastor, what about everyone else. That's just in reference to ministers. Well, 2 Corinthians 5 includes all men. Paul says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And so all of us will appear before him, and he will judge what we have done together. Galatians 6, 4, but let each one test his own work, for each will have to bear his own load. All of us are responsible for our Christian lives, our conduct, our behavior. We will all give an account, every single one of them. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. We are always ignorant of even the slightest of conduct, the slightest of behavior. May he have mercy on us, because we will one day give an account. And realize that out of those three examples of judgment, all of these concern Christians. Matter of fact, the latter two only involve believers and no unbelievers there. And so there is a great judgment upon those who have heard the truth. There is a great judgment of those who have heard the preaching, who have been saved, but do not walk in, the, in alignment with the walk of their Savior. We will be judged severely. This is why John says to the Christians in his epistle, in 1 John 2, 28, And now, little children... Abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. The question, beloved, is on the day of his return, will you have confidence before the judge of the earth? Will you have confidence as you stand individually before his presence that you walked in line with him? Or will you shrink in shame because you have used your days and hours in total 
disobedience and unfaithfulness to the commands of God. Brethren, if we desire to have confidence on that great day of judgment, then let us watch now, carefully, presently, now. We must watch with great caution, not tomorrow, now. If we desire to be confident at his return. So in all of this, what I'm really trying to say is that verse 1, when it says, Judge not that you be not judged, the first and primary reason why we are not to be so hypercritical over our neighbors as a act and a behavior of our fruitfulness aside from Christ is so that we would not be severely judged by our Heavenly Father who is the ultimate judge as well. We desire not to receive such severe punishment for our blemishes. But when you go to Luke chapter 637, we read this together, and I encourage you to flip with me now because we're going to look at the extension of that statement in Luke 6, 37. And Luke's account writes a little bit more in that first statement. He says, judge not and you will not be judged. But he adds on and says, condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. The point is that the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to have an attitude that is hesitant to condemn our neighbors. One thing that we should ask the Lord in helping us mortify our flesh, asking God, Lord, why is it that I am so quick to judge? Why is it that I'm so quick to condemn those that you've died for, according to Romans 14? Why am I so quick to tear down? And then you'll realize the sinfulness of sin. You'll realize the deceitfulness of sin that the New Testament author speaks of. And how puny you are before such a holy God. But it's important that you ask yourself that. Not only your neighbors in the church, but why we are able to judge so quickly of those outside in the world. So the Lord in this statement in verse 37, he says, be hesitant to judge and condemn a person, to conclude them in total curse, but be quick to forgive. That's really what verse 37 is about. Hesitant to condemn, but quick to forgive. I think if that is the principle that we walk by as believers, we will learn from each other much more, much quicker. And our unity will grow faster. Our unity will be more efficient. It will walk in the way of the Lord and the world will see the love of Christ in us. It is that accuser of the brethren, the devil, that brings forth this type of influence and pattern to the church. We must not become this way. We must not condemn, for we will be condemned. Think about that in its severity. Imagine the terror of doing the exact opposite of what Jesus says in Luke 6.37. He says, condemn not, and you will not be condemned. This is not referring only to the condemnation of neighbors. The moment you practice a habit of con condemnation toward your neighbors, you will face the ultimate condemnation of God himself. And most of all, if you will not be quick to forgive your neighbors, then you will also face the terror of God not hearing your prayers as well. We read this in Matthew 6 before we studied this together, Matthew 6, 15. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And what I love about Luke's account here is that he does not only give us the negative of what we aren't supposed to do, but he tells us what we must be in verse 38. So he says, judge not, condemn not, but forgive. And in 38, he says, give, and it will be given to you. Instead of being generous in handing out great condemnation to everybody, be willing to be generous in considering your neighbor in all good things. I'm not restricting you to material things only, but in all good things, brethren, we must be generous in thinking of our neighbor's good, to build them up into Christ, that we may consider one another in this great work of generosity. And you see, the Father is truly a Father who rewards in return, because what is connected to this statement of give and it will be given to you 
It is a great reward graphically illustrated to your souls concerning what the Heavenly Father will do if you become a generous individual. Remember Peter warns husbands, they say, uh, sorry, he says to the husbands, uh, treat your wives tenderly and with care, lest God doesn't hear your prayers. He says uh, your prayers are hindered when you don't treat your neighbors kindly. And I think this is also in connection. To give is to be kind. To give is to share in all good things with your neighbors. And so this is what we should be thankful for, is that as we are generous toward our peers, the Heavenly Father will reward us. And what I love about this expression is that he does not say that he will reward us in a great, in a, sorry, in a small way. But the illustration is the illustration of a farmer who does a certain procedure and the outcome is a great abundance. The words, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and he says, will be put into your lap. Christ's concern is that you would receive the goodness of the Father as you live in the goodness of your Father toward others. Now, what does that exactly mean? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. I remember we used to sing a song like this back in the day, and, and it was about uh, breaking off the shackles of our own sins, but that's not what it's referring to um, here in this text. One commentator studied the life of a farmer, and he looked at the, the life of a farmer, and he put it into these words. <clears throat> he says, the measuring of the corn is a process which is carried out according to an established pattern. The seller crouches on the ground with the measure between his legs. First, he fills the measure three quarters full and gives it a good shake with a rot rotatory motion to make the grain settle down. Then he fills the measure to the top and gives it another shake. Next, he presses the corn together, strong with both hands. Finally, he heaps it into a cone, tapping it carefully to press grains together from time to time. He bores a hole into the cone and pours a few more grains into it until there is literally no more room for a single grain. In this way, the purchaser is guaranteed an absolutely full measure. It cannot hold more. And so this procedure, step by step, is actually what they do with corn. And the seller it presses down, shakes the bag together, pokes holes, and ensures that the, the grain runs over and that he could fill it more and so that whoever would be the recipient of this bag of goods would have it topped, topped up. And what that really is implying to us is that our generosity in sharing all good things with our neighbor will result in the great abundance of your souls. And God is so good in mercy to do that. He uses the words will be put into your lap. You ought to believe it. Loving your brethren and being generous to your neighbor will result in the blessing of God into your own very laps. And then he says, as it is stated both in Matthew and Luke, which is the second reason why we should not judge severely. Remember the first. We judge not severely because we do not want to be utterly judged by God himself on that final day where we shrink. But secondly, he says... For with the measure you use it will be measured back to you. Did you know that when you judge or that when we judge, whether severely, and I guess you could even add constructively. Constructively is good. Severely is bad. But I guess whether it is constructive or severe, did you know that whenever you pronounce any sort of criticism or any sort of judgment, you are setting a standard for your own judgment? You are laying down a principle by which God is going to judge you. You have laid down a measuring tape, and God will take his law, and he will review whether you live up to the standard of your own rule. Again, it could be understood twofold. When you pronounce judgment unto your neighbor, yes, they may receive it, but the automatic nature of man is that when they receive criticism, they will send it the other way. If not send it, they will review whether the person who is giving forth such judgment is worthy to pronounce that type of criticism. Again, whether severely or constructively. 
We as believers are watched by the world and we watch one another. Paul says, what have I to do to judge the world? They are already condemned. He says, are we not called to judge the household of God? And so we in the church are not just people who come and listen God's, to God's word, but we care for one another. We account for each other's souls. And so that means in sharing in all good things, but at the same time, even in discipline. But we ought to make sure that when we measure a man according to what we see, that when he views our own lives, that we do not also share the same fallenness and blemish that the man we are uh, criticizing has. So first, that could be viewed that way. Our neighbor will examine whether you are true to your own measure. But ultimately, the second, God again will judge you according to your own standards. Luke 12, uh, Luke 12 uh, remember the Lord says that he who has more will be required more. In other words, he will be, be beaten more. If he knows more but he disobeys, he will be beaten more. But the one who does not know and disobeys will be beaten less. We are more familiar with the term, less stripes, greater stripes. And in a more applicable term with our theme today, it's no different than saying, if you judge severely, you will be judged severely. If you say you know more of scripture, you will be judged on the basis of your, uh, of your claim. If you say that you have studied more, you will be judged based upon what you've studied. If you say, say you counsel more, you will be judged based upon your counseling. And so you will be judged. And yet we have the tendency to say, well, pastor, if that's the case, I'd rather not read the Bible. If that's the case, I'd rather not say anything, lest I would be judged with great severity. Of course not. Uh, we are called for a great balance. But remember this, the more you say, the more you will be measured on the great day of judgment. This is why the Apostle James in chapter 3, a chapter that we don't like to read, because, uh, well, the early church, sorry, the, uh, the church during the Reformation didn't like James because James often didn't really talk about faith as much, and so they don't, don't like reading James. It's, they say that James is ranting a lot, but James is speaking of truth. It is in line with justification by faith. And James in chapter 3 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. That is scary. And I am terrified just reading that to you. Yes, you are looking at your preacher, who on that great day, every word that I preach to you will be judged and measured to me. But he says, don't be all teachers. You position yourself in such, a, uh, in such a way, you position yourself to be judged by the greater authority. You want to be viewed superior over the flock, then you will be judged by the greater superior. We will be judged with greater strictness. Take it from me, beloved. I have cried many times to the Lord in private, repenting of many times of failures, of poor delivery of constructive criticism, poor delivery of my zeal of God's word, I do not want you to fall into the same hole. I plead to the Lord because that is a great terror to my soul, that one day I will face the King of Kings, the ultimate judge of the earth, and he will look down on your servant, and he will judge me based upon all those severe cases and claims. And so this is not a teaching for the proud to rejoice in. It's a teaching for the proud to be humiliated. That's really what it is. And so for the corporate whole, we must be cautious of how we express ourselves, but not be surprised that when we do pronounce judgment on another, that God will judge us by our own very standard. Why is that principle the way to go? Because it is truly fair, it is truly just, that we are measured the same way. And so when the preacher studies, he does not just study to preach to the crowd, but he first must preach to himself. 
And likewise, take that example that when you are preparing to help your brother to bring him up in the, in the knowledge of the Lord, that you must first study for your own soul to see whether you are in line with God or are you quick to jump to the finger and point. Next, in verse 39 through 40, he transitions to our third reason why we should not judge not. Or, sorry, that didn't make any sense. <laughs> he transitions to the third reason why we should not judge. And he provides us a parable. And I think by this point, if we just read, let's read one moment. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they bo not both fall into a pit? That's the question. It's a rhetorical question that he's asking his disciples. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? And I think at this point of our teaching, it is safe to say that all who judge severely have impaired vision. Everybody who judges with censorious attitudes and hypercritical spirits have impaired vision. They have impaired vision because if they had viewed God's grace much better in their lives, they wouldn't be judging so critically. If they understood the mercy of God for their own poor souls, they would not be treating their neighbors so poorly. And so the Lord asked the question, can a blind man lead a blind man? The obvious answer is no. The blind man is ineffective when it comes to guidance. He will take you to the walls. He will take you to many hindrances and obstacles in your way. He cannot see himself. That's why he is ineffective when it comes to guidance. And so the person who is censorious in spirit cannot lead another man. Be careful of this because those who are quick to criticize are always those who feel like they're doing their neighbor a favor. That is the greatest deception if they are not watching. A great deception to themselves. That I must point out their sin. It does not matter if it is critical. It is without grace. It is without mercy and sensitivity. I must expose sin for what it is, even if it causes the hurt of your neighbor and they will say, well, it is truth, it is out of zeal. You must be cautious with that. Lest you be deceived that you actually are the blind man and you are unable to build the man up because you have not seasoned your judgment with grace. You have seasoned it with hot temper. You have seasoned it with uh, haste and arrogance and aggression. And so the blind man is the one with a judgmental attitude. And he who supposes in himself that he can guide a lot of people, he just can't. He can't be a good um, discipler. He is not a good teacher. He does not present to himself a good example. He fails even in his own life. He is blind. And so he is blinded by self-righteousness and arrogance. And he is not to be followed. Why? Because when you follow him, Daryl Box says something about this very great when he says he will lead you into uh, a pit. And I think our English translation makes a very right pit because pits are not shallow. It's not just a ditch you get stuck in. A pit is so deep, Daryl says it's deep, deep, a great deep. And the blind man who's arrogant, who is censorious, will lead you into that pit with him. This is why in verse 40, the Lord follows up that statement, and he says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. And what does he mean by this? Number one, it is a warning to all disciples not to go beyond the example that the Lord Jesus Christ is laying before them. If I, the Lord, am merciful to you, do not go beyond your master in taking the position of the sovereign to be severe over your neighbor. It is a warning to all of us not to be above our master, not to esteem ourselves higher than the master, not to esteem ourselves higher than being mere servants. But in another sense, verse 40 also warns us to choose wisely who we're following. 
because our teacher is the one who provides us the great constructive criticism. He's the one that critiques our lives according to the truth of God's word. And we must choose wisely who we follow because the true teacher of God's word will lead you to holiness. But the man who is blinded by his own self-righteousness and arrogance will lead you to your downfall. This is why the Lord says this in verse 40. In another sense, be cautious of who you choose to follow. And in our case, we are following the Lord Jesus Christ. So then let us not be above our own teacher. In closing this morning, we will finish off with verse 41 through to 42. In our Lord's final reasoning, why we should not judge severely. The last and final one, I think, is uh, greatly clear. He says, how can you say to your father, or sorry, to your brother, in verse 42, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye. And then in verse 41, do you not notice the log that is in your own eye? The last reason why we should not judge severely is because you're incapable of it. You do not, you do not bear the authority to do so. You do not bear the authority to do so because you do not even have it in yourself to see your own eye, your own filth. And so it is not in your grounds to position yourself to execute such judgment because you too are judged. You also have dirt. The log in the eye is the wood. The, uh, many times in the clinic before, many cases would come in on, on emergency days and they would have logs in their eyes. They would have wood stuck deep into their eyes and it would be so hard to take it out. I'd like you to look at that illustration very carefully in the comparison of our Lord. He says, you are trying to look into your neighbor's eye to see the log and take it out. That is a hard procedure. The doctor is going to have to go in deep. He's going to have to put anesthesia on there. He's going to have to use certain tools to get deep into your eye. Sometimes he might even have to take you to the operating room to do it. And so putting a judgment on your neighbor is not something that we should do lightly or loosely. And easily, we should be cautious. But the problem is, imagine, I'm your eye doctor, I will perform your eye surgery, but I'm also blind as well. It's not going to help anybody, anyone. <laughs> we will lead them to the pit. Romans 2, please turn there quickly, Romans chapter 2. Verse 1. It says here, Therefore you have no excuse, O man. Now who is he talking to here? The Jews who felt privileged to have the law, to have the prophets, to have the writings. They were so censorious toward the Gentiles. And Paul is saying, therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Remember the beginning of the sermon I mentioned to you that this threat the Lord is concerned about does not only destroy our relationship, destroys our neighbor, but ultimately destroys you. I love the fact that Paul mentions that when you pass judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. That's what the Lord is saying. You have the speck in your eye. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? You will not. And I think the greatest deception that the enemy will place in our mind is that we are so righteous, that we are so good, that I am so willing to judge every single person. You are being deceived because on the day of wrath, you are storing for yourself, sorry, you are storing for yourself wrath for the day of wrath. Do not take judgment lightly. And that's why that statement in verse 37 of Luke 6, the Lord says, do not judge, do not condemn, but be quick to forgive. 
Furthermore, the incapability of the man who judges is exposed at the fact that he is not really concerned about truth. You can argue that from verse 41 through 42, the man who is censorious does not really care about truth. Remember I told you last Lord's Day, the censorious man is not concerned about the issue. He's not even concerned about the problem. He's mainly concerned about the downfall of the person. This person doesn't care about truth. They might say, well, I'm a person of truth. I'm a person of righteousness. That's not true. How do you know so? If you might ask, Pastor, how do you know that this person does not care about truth? Well, because the Lord says that he does not even notice his own eye. Because if a man truly is a man of truth, he will not be quick to point the finger. He will first be confronted by the truth in his own conscience. And he will stand like Isaiah did on, on that day he received that vision. And he will crumble before the holy God. And he will see himself as sinful man. And he first will judge himself. And he will say, woe is me, I am unclean. If a man truly is concerned about truth, he will judge himself whether he lives accordingly to the law of God. And it is so important to him, so valuable to him, that he measures himself so intensely. And only then the man is able. That's why I say the man is not concerned about truth. He only cares about himself. Because if he did care about truth, he would clean his own eye. You see, brethren, if righteousness truly was our motive in our judgments, then we would not judge first others but ourselves. And yet, as we become so focused and attached to these people, we become so obscured in our judgments. We become biased. You are not fit to be judges. You are not fit to be examiners if you become so attached to the person I love the fact that the New Testament teachings always warn us about our hatred toward our neighbor. It's not even about the issue, not about the problem. The truth is we hate our brother. And we become so attached, almost obsessed with the lives of other people that we lose sight of our own judgment. Take, for example, the courtrooms. When you are invited to the courtroom, I know some of you have been invited, though you didn't want to go there as a member of a jury. Think about the members of the jury. The moment the courts find out that there is some sort of connection with members of the jury, with the member that is on trial, the member of the jury is immediately disqualified. Why? Because if the members of the jury are personally attached to the member on trial, they will be biased in their judgment. If they hate the criminal, they'll send him to jail. If they're friends with the criminal, they will let him out, not guilty. This is why the courts invite random people. Take that for example, even unbelieving courts follow the principle that is found in scripture. We do not want an attachment in our judgment personality involved in it or personal attachments in our judgments because we become biased, we become partial, we lose sights of objectivity. And the scripture calls us to judge. The scripture calls us to test the spirits. But we must do so objectively. So the question is, Pastor, does this mean we cannot help our brother? No, you are called to help your brother. But first, you need, you need to swallow this very personal sharp pill down your throat. I need to swallow. What? Well, before the Lord says, help them, what does he say? He says in verse 42, you hypocrite. He speaks to everyone and anyone who lives a life so censorious and he calls you a hypocrite. We must adhere to the maker of hearts who discerns our hearts, and we must take that correction as a whole. And so what does he say? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. We must resolve this issue by examining ourselves. We must admit to ourselves who we are 
We must humble ourselves before the Holy God. Does this mean I have to be perfect? One, one uh, gentleman came to me and said, Pastor, uh, this is why I don't, I don't talk because I want to first do all this first. I, and in the case, it's true. But, but you're, you're never going to be perfect. And that's not the point that the Lord is making here. He is saying that when you pass judgment is with caution, but first with self-examination. Because self-examination surely softens the heart of man to be gracious when he speaks to his brother. When you speak to God and you commune with him concerning your case, you will never judge wrongly or abusively. Pastor, how do I execute judgment then? How do I help my brother if I know he's sinning? Read 1 Corinthians 13 daily. Not just in the moment you're going to judge someone, but it's about your relationships with anybody. Read that. Ask yourselves, how is your attitude like? How do you deliver your own advice? Do you live by your own advice? How is your conduct like? How is your behavior like? Do you follow the pattern of truth? We must ask those questions. And we must pray to the God or to God to have mercy on us. That we may teach the truth, but speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4:15. Speak it in love. And yet, brethren, if we are being corrected by someone who is giving us objective counsel, that we would receive that criticism in love. If you want to avoid God's severe judgment in this life, then adhere to these words in Matthew and Luke. Judge not. But most of all, look to the grace of God shed on Calvary for your soul. And think and meditate upon God's mercy in saving you who is filthy, who is wretched, who is, Paul said, the chief of all sinners. Do you consider yourself the chief of all sinners? Look to the grace of God in His Son that you may receive mercy upon your own very soul and that we may display this unto others. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you that you are the all-knowing God. You are the searcher of hearts and you know whether men who here today truly have received your counsel with trembling you know what plays in the minds of men. You know all things. But we ask this hour that you would cleanse us of our own sins, forgive us of our own iniquity, that we would not fall to the terror of your great wrath, a judgment in this life that could be so severe. Father, help us then consider your words through your Son to be hesitant in condemnation, but to be quick in forgiveness, to first remove the filth in our own eyes and then help our brother if it be necessary. Take away from this Unify our relationships. Allow it to be grounded upon constructive criticism that will point us to holiness. Allow our church to thrive in the truth of your word, never neg neglecting that you have taught us. And so gracious and most generous Father, forgive us and teach us sound wisdom that in this way you would be glorified. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.